This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in verse 20, Paul says, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Many people today have connections and communication with devils, whether they know it or not. So in this chapter, I'm going to show you how you can have fellowship with devils. So if you're doing any of these things, then you need to get them out of your life. So how do people end up having fellowship with devils or with unclean spirits? Number one, they get the wrong rock. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the true rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this world has the wrong rock. They don't have fellowship with the Lord. They have fellowship with devils. Their rock is an actual rock because they believe they came from a rock. So their faith is in education, evolution, the Big Bang Theory, and science falsely so called. Deuteronomy 32, 31 says, For their rock is not as our rock. So they stumble when it comes to the real rock. 1 Peter 2, 8 says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Romans nine thirty three, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So Jesus Christ isn't the rock of this world. He's not the rock of this world he's not what people want him to be he's not imagine dragons and foo fighters and slipknot and bleak 182 and other godless rock bands that's out there today he is the rock so do you want fellowship with devils then get the wrong rock a rock like i just mentioned one of those rock bands uh, when you go in a young person's room, it is obvious most times who their rock is. They have rock posters, rocker clothes, the DVD shelf reveals who their rock is. But the rock that we have, that it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is the one who brought Moses and Israel through the Red Sea. This is that real rock. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The rock that brought them through the Red Sea is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Exodus 14, 21 through 22, it says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. In your Bible calls this a baptism, showing you that the word baptism in the Bible doesn't always refer to believers' water baptism although this can be a picture of that. But the rock that brought them through the sea was the Lord Jesus Christ. He had just gotten them away from Egypt after the Passover, where they had applied the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And in the Passover, if the blood was applied to the doorposts, then the Lord would spare the firstborn of that house. Just like when you got saved, the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was applied to your soul. Now notice how the Bible illustrates New Testament salvation in the Old Testament. Moses and Israel had just had the Passover, which is the picture of the blood saving your soul. Then, if you read in 1 Corinthians 10, 1, it says they were all under the cloud. And Exodus 13, 21 through 22 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, 
and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So this is a picture of your eternal security after you get saved. This happened after the Passover, showing eternal security, and then they passed under the under the cloud. They went through the Red Sea on dry ground. It, that pictures believers' baptism. Now, who el what else is something you do after you get saved? Like I said, you get water baptized, and that is pictured by Israel being baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And, that's, and in verse 2 here in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they had the Passover. The cloud was not t taken away from them. And then they went through the Red Sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. You see how amazing the Bible is? It just showed you a picture of you getting saved by the blood of the Lamb. It showed you a picture of eternal security in Exodus 13. And then it shows you a picture of water baptism when they passed through the cloud. When they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then verse 3 says in 1 Corinthians 10, And did all eat the same spiritual meat, so the Lord dropped down manna from heaven for Israel. In Exodus 16:15. Which says, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So this manna pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in John chapter 6, 48 through 51, Jesus says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Not only did the rock take care of their hunger and our spiritual hunger, he also took care of their physical thirst and our spiritual thirst. Verse 4 in 1 Corinthians 10, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Moses was told to smite the rock, and water would be supplied for Israel. In Exodus seventeen six, it says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And then in Numbers 20 and verse 80, it says, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So the rock shows us Jesus Christ, who is the rock. He was smitten for our sins, and from him we get living water, like he told the woman about in John chapter 4. And you have that living water if you have the true rock. Not punk rock, alternative rock, rap rock, glam rock, arena rock, hard rock, southern rock, or grunge rock. But the rock of ages. That's what you have if you have the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 10, But with many of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Okay, they're overthrown in the wilderness. If you look at Numbers 14, 29 through 30, it says, Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So we should learn from example and not be killed for the same sins as they were. It said, with many of them, God was not plead, well pleased. When you read the Old Testament, always remember to look at things people did that displeases God. That way you don't do the same thing. So if you want to have fellowship with devils, if that's something that you want to do, then you got to get the wrong rock. Don't go after the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't seek the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the real rock. Seek the rocks of this world. 
But the next tip on how you can have fellowship with devils is lust after evil things. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 6, it says, Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. The things in the Old Testament are our examples. There is really no excuse for the Old Testament not to be read, memorized, meditated on, studied, and taught, and preached. But, it, but you see, Israel lusted after the things they had in Egypt. Egypt is the top of the world. And as Christians, we shouldn't lust after the things that are in this world. There are times when your flesh rises up and you will desire the same sinful things that you had when you were in bondage to the world, just like Israel lusted after the things they had when they were in bondage to Egypt. The devils thrive off your lustful thoughts. As you're lusting, you're not, restraint, you're not retaining God in your knowledge, and this hurts your walk and fellowship with the Lord. And you'll begin to set the table for devils. In verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Neither be, I, be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So what this verse is talking about is remember back in Exodus chapter 32 when Moses went away just for a bit and Israel made a golden calf. That's what this is talking about. The absence of preaching from Moses, the absence of hearing the words of God from Moses can cause you to lose fellowship when you're not around your, your preacher or something like that. Uh, preaching and prayer and Bible reading will strengthen your relationship with God and always keep these things consistently in your, in your life. Pray that you aren't turned away from the Lord if you go through temporary absence from these things for whatever reason. Now, you know what will really give you fellowship with devils? Sexual sins. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8, it says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So fornication, which is a sexual act with anyone you're not married to, brought death. And there is no doubt that devils are connected tightly with sexual sin. Pornography addiction, uh, perverted fantasies and daydreams are connected with devils. Pornography addiction leads to wicked and bizarre sexual sin like sodomy and bestiality and incest. And this is why these things are all spoke of in the book of Leviticus. It starts out with a young boy who has a natural desire for an attractive woman. But the pornication leads to weird and even more twisted sexual sins like pedophilia. He has to keep getting more and more deranged to get that same thrill that he once had. And this is fellowship with devils. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. So, for this wicked sin and others, there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. But that was just one day. There was an an altogether number of 24,000. In Numbers 25 and verse 9, it says, And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. This happened after Israel yoked up with the daughters of Moab, Moab, which led them down a road of fornication and idolatry. And Paul says in... 1 Corinthians 6, 18, to abstain from fornication. Although everyone is committing the sin, it doesn't make it right. Slang terms for fornication today is someone saying they're going to go watch Netflix and chill. And that is to make it seem like the right thing to do. But what it, which is more filthy? What's going on in the Netflix original movies? Or what's going on on the couch between two people that aren't married to each other. Both are filthy. Sexual sins means fellowship with devils. When you commit fornication with someone, a devil jumps on you. But do you want to have fellowship with devils? Another thing you can do to, do, to have fellowship with devils is complain constantly and never be content with what the Lord's given you. In verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. 
So how did they tempt Christ? They did it with their complaining mouth. In Numbers 21, 5, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. So they ended up getting a bit, getting bit by fiery serpents. And Moses put a serpent on a pole. And if they looked on the serpent, then they would be healed. Jesus became the serpent on the cross for us. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We had been bit by the serpent. But Peter says, by whose stripes you were healed. We're healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want your sins taken care of, then look to Jesus Christ. Because it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So as Israel looked at the serpent on the pole to get healed of their snake bite, we got to look to the Lord Jesus Christ to get healed of our sin problem. Now, 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, look back at Numbers 11 and verse 1, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So you see, the Lord doesn't like the complaining and the murmuring. Murmuring seems to go a bit further than complaining. In Psalms 106, 25, it says, But murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. So Israel would go in their tents and murmur about Moses. They would go in there and just complain about him. They didn't think that, you know, he was the right one to lead them at times. And so 1 Corinthians 10, 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. So the Lord hates complaining and murmuring. We have no room to complain. And when you get around people who complain, it can almost be contagious. Every time you want to complain at work, just remember how good you have it compared to how you used to have it. Or remember how good you have it compared to how someone else has it. Or remember how good you have it compared to somebody in hell. And you'll complain a lot less. A complaining shows unthankfulness. But 1 Corinthians 10, 11, All these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things happen for in samples to the people back then and for our examples. So these things are written for our admonition. They were written for our learning. A daily dose of the Old Testament it's something that we all need. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So you can't stand on your own. If you are, then, then you will fall. Take heed lest you fall. If you live for the flesh, you're going to die. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So, you want to have fellowship with devils? Then you give in to every temptation that the devils throw your way. When you are tempted with something, you have to fight it. The reason you always give in to it is probably because you're not even fighting it. When the devil says to do something... Pray to God to send you an escape route. He's always got a way to escape. There is no temptation coming your way that somebody somewhere isn't experiencing. There is no temptation that the Lord hasn't seen. There is no temptation taking you that the Lord wasn't tempted with himself. So he can show you a way to escape. He's seen it before. He's been in the situation before. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. When, when temptation arises, flee. When it comes to idolatry, flee. 2 Timothy 2, 22, Flee also youthful lusts. 1, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 10 through 11, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. 
1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee fornication. Real men run away from things. Real men flee from sin. There isn't any, anything unmanly about running away from sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So you see something that's going to tempt you. Run as fast as you can the other direction. Idolatry is the worship of any idol, image, work of men's hands, or anything that isn't the God of the Bible. You need to flee from idolatry. Do you know what you worship? What is on your mind the most? You can make an idol out of anything. You want to have fellowship with devils? Give into, give into temptation and cling to false idols. You want to have fellowship with devils? Get in a false satanic religion. In 1 Corinthians 10, 15 through 16, it says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? It is the communion of the blood of Christ, because we are all saved by the blood of Christ. If you are a born-again believer, then you're saved by the blood of Christ. So it's the communion of the blood of Christ. It's the communion of the body of Christ because we are saved and in the body. Because look at the next verse. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. We are all partakers of the Lord's table and not the devil's table when we remember his sacrifice for us, when we do the communion, realizing that it isn't his literal flesh and blood that we're drinking. So you want to be partakers of the Lord's table, as it says in verse 21. 1 Corinthians 10, 19, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? The idol and whatsoever is sacrificed to it is nothing. It isn't anything. 1 Corinthians 10, 20, But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So the Catholic Church, a satanic, false religious cult, considers what they call Eucharist, their communion, they consider it a sacrifice, even though it's a memorial. They believe they are literally eating Jesus' flesh and blood. But the Lord never commanded us to drink or eat literal flesh and blood. So such an unscriptural, unscriptural practice is partaking of the de table of devils <clears throat> and drinking the cup of devils. And verse 21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. Verse 22 and 23, Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful unto me, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Just because much of things are lawful for us to do, they might not be a sin for us to do. This doesn't mean all those things will edify someone else. And a good way to get out from under the hold of devils is to start thinking about someone else other than yourself. Think about edifying someone else. As it says in verse 24, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. This isn't the philosophy of men today. Today it is me first, you next. And men are lovers of their own selves, as the Bible prophesied. Now verse 25, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So the shambles is like the meat markets. Whatsoever is sold there, go ahead and eat it, even if it is offered to an idol, don't think about it being offered to an idol. Ask no question for conscience sake, as the verse said. Because it's, because it's the Lord's anyway. As it says in verse 26, For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. In verse 27, If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat. Asking no question for conscience sake. So, if an unbeliever invites you over to eat, if he had meat that was offered to an idol, you can eat it. Just don't ask anything about it. But verse 28 says, But if any man say unto you, This is offered and sacrificed unto idols, 
eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Although the idol is nothing, and the meat is nothing, if someone comes up to you and says, this is meat offered to an idol, then don't eat it. Don't wound their weak conscience. As Paul says in other verses, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 10 through 13, For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standest lest I make my brother to offend. So in the next verse, in 1 Corinthians 10, 29 through 30, it says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I, by grace, be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? So even though Paul had liberty to do many things, some men might see those things as a sin when they actually weren't. So Paul would also have to think about another man's conscience. And Paul could give thanks over anything and eat it. But he also had to think about making his brother to be offended. Now verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So if God isn't glorified in a thing, then you shouldn't do it. If man is being glorified over God in something, then don't do it. Verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And here is the three categories of people in the Bible, Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. When you read the Bible, depending on where you're at, that portion of Scripture will apply to one of these three groups of people, and that's how you rightly divide. Verse 33, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So Paul cared more about the souls of men that they may be saved than he did about his own personal liberties and convictions. Some men care more about their own convictions than they do the soul of another person. For example, I know stories of people who were mad because their loved one got saved under a preacher of a different denomination than their family's been. They cared more about defending the beliefs of their denomination or camp or cult than they do the soul of another person. If a man gets saved, I don't care where he is or where he's at when he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as long as he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for someone to be mad about someone getting saved, that shows that person is in close fellowship with devils whether they know it or not. But there's many examples of someone caring more about the defending their beliefs than they do about the soul of another person that shows that they're just contentious and are having fellowship with devils but this has been first corinthians chapter 10 about how to have fellowship with devils and if you're doing any of these things the best thing you can do is get them out of your life as quick as you can if you're not saved then you need to get saved by believing on the lord jesus christ he died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. He shed his blood on the cross. And you need to believe on him today. And he can give you everlasting life. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're already saved and you're doing some of these sins mentioned, then just come to Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just confess your sins and get back in fellowship.